Welcome to the Guam International Christian Church. Who will be with us today? Can you guys please help me out in my native tongue? Try to say hello to them. And how we do that is we say Hafa Tata Manoha. Ready? Hafa <laughs> This is getting better every Sunday. And again, we apologize for that. We know we won. Well, it's awesome to have our brothers and sisters from Guam joining us uh, also today. Sorry that you get the best message. You guys are having great weather. I hope that you recovered from the typhoon down there, as I heard it was super devastating. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about identity. Uh, identity comes in all different shapes and forms. Uh, there's identity theft, there's who are you, and then uh, you don't know my name. There's all these different types of identities. Uh, one of the things that I grew up, grow up I grew, growing up, as I felt like I did not have an identity. Over the years, I found myself asking, where am I? Who am I? Who should I be? And I always wanted to fit into all these different shoes and wear different types of hats. But I could not fit into any of them. There was a time in the 1980s where I was wearing Converse and sometimes not here at Jordan. I had bandanas in every uh, extremity of my body. I had a left Zeppelin shirt with a choker that had a bunch of studs and a sideways hat with a bunch of colorful pins. It was a cross between a uh, pop rocking, punk rocking, break dancing, very confused man who tried to fit into all these different places. And I know I'm not the only one here. God, I know you're guilty of that. <laughs> According to Kevin's rules, I'm pretty sure he's guilty of that. But I, I try to fit into all these places. I don't know if you can relate to that. And in life, whenever, whenever fashion changes, we change our fashion. Everybody's wearing something from this century, and a couple of us from the century in the past. But it always changes us. It changes who we are, who we think we are, how we feel today, how we felt yesterday. So I wanted to look at, and I was inspired because I was, I was listening to uh, uh, the story about that born identity in the Jason series. And I was like, man, this guy didn't know who he was. He was trying to figure himself out. Such an action movie. But the born identity we want to talk about is the B-O-R-N. The born identity. From the day you were physically born till now, who are you? Who really is? Are you? And then you think about who you are before the Lord. That's truly what we want to see and find out today in our message. So please be turning your Bibles with me to Matthew 27. We're looking at the examples here. Two guys that got pretty much a fair shake at being uh, apostles and hanging out with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was Judas and Peter. And so the first point of our lesson, we have three points. The first point, our lesson title was identity. The first point is, your true color rises in the face of identity crisis. Your true color really does rise up during a time of identity crisis. Now, identity crisis is a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a, person, a person's sense of identity gets lost. They're confused, typically due to change of marital status due to change of financial instability or stability or financial gain, due to a loss of a parent or gaining a new parent, due to a change in school. I mean, if you think back, when you were in high school, you acted a certain way. But as you migrated into the campus ministry, you had to kind of fit in. Uh, do I still say, I mean, why? When dude came up to me, he was like, you have to change the way you speak. You can't be saying like and um in every single sentence like I do sometimes. And so we look at this identity. And we go, wow, we're shifting and changing and molding and turning into someone new every day as we speak. Right now, you're exactly not the person you were before. Right now, in the next five seconds, your body will change. Right now, in the next five seconds, your mind will think something different. You are no longer the person as of right now you were five seconds ago. Your body will continue to change. Your molecular structure will continue to change. Uh, unfortunately, I've changed in many other ways. Uh, I used to be a size 28, and then one day, I'm not that. We'll, we'll try to segue back into this thing and, and, and shy away from that. But we look at the life of two apostles. Their identities. They were challenged during a time where, where, where they would follow the Lord. One whose name was Judas, and the other was Peter. Both awesome guys. We're going to take a look, and I pulled off some information 
from, our, uh, from a church site uh, that belongs to us. And I looked at similarities of Judas and Simon Peter. And we're going to look at some of this. Both had respectable positions among the apostles. Judas had the privilege of being the treasurer. So much so that even when Jesus said, hey, the one who's going to betray me is the one who's going to dip his hand, right? So much so that nobody actually pointed out and said, is that Judas? Then you can see the comparison when you look back in John 13. Peter, in the same way, was probably one of Jesus' closest apostles, one of Jesus' closest disciples. He was there uh, with, uh, along with uh, John and James. They often spent time alone with Jesus and witnessed things that were not seen by the other, uh, the other nine apostles. For example, the transfiguration. Now, the similarities, each one, in various occasions, had to be rebuked or strongly corrected by Jesus. There was that time when Judas uh, was complaining about the expensive perfume being wasted, and then Jesus rebuked him. And then Peter was rebuked and corrected many times. Well, you know the stories, the Bible stories of, uh, of Jesus correcting Peter. But specifically, there was a time where, when Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. And you read about that in Matthew 16, 23. They were equally rebuked, right? And then there are other examples when they, when they both betrayed Jesus. So we're going to fast forward to a time where Jesus predicted his death. And he said that both of you guys here, you will die for me. But we're going to look at the identity crisis in their life. There's going to be a time when their life will dramatically change. And then we face of making a decision that will have an eternal impact on them. And how it affects us here today. So turn your Bibles with me. As we see, uh, I'm going to put you right there in Matthew 27. As we see that Peter at this time denied the Lord as the Lord predicted three times. What was Peter feeling at this moment? What was Peter thinking? What did he look like physically? He must have been slouching, filled with remorse, sad. He certainly wasn't happy at all. Because he betrayed the Lord. And as he heard the first rooster crow, he remembered, oh my goodness, I betrayed the Lord. Peter comes to this reality where his life completely changes. I want to ask you this morning, is there something in your life that you came to a realization this morning, last week, financially, spiritually, maybe in a relationship, father to child, and child to parents? Maybe your business is suffering a little bit this morning. Maybe your grades are starting to descend a little bit. And you're just challenged in your life altogether. Yeah. In a time of crisis, how you show your true colors will determine the outcome of your future. In a time of crisis, how you show your true colors will determine the outcome of your near future. I want to challenge you as we look into the eyes of the scriptures, the holy word of God. That we put ourselves in the, in the current position as if we were in the first century. And it's hot right now. And we're wearing garments. And we have sandals on. And this is truly happening. You're Judas. And you're Peter. And the Lord's present. And then we pick up our text in Matthew 27. Now bear with me as I'm using a brand new Bible here. It's the Holman version. Uh, it was a gift given to me by Kyle when he appointed me evangelist. And I'm just uh, really stoked about the reading here. Thanks for bearing with me. Alright, honey. Go hard. <laughs> 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 Sounds a little awkward with the voice is deep. But I do appreciate that. And so in, in, in verse, uh, let's, let's take it to Matthew 26. We're going to look at the response of Peter. And in verse 40, I'm sorry, 74 of chapter 26, it reads, Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I do not know this man. Immediately the rooster crowed, and he heard it again. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus that Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept. Dinner. Peter was busted on his tracks, had nowhere to run, and fully masculinely exposed. The Lord, he was taken up by, by the Spirit of God. And then we look at the reaction of Judas here, right? And, and over in 27, starting verse 3, it says, Then Judas, his betrayer,
betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was filled with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. What's that to us? They said, see to it your own self. So he threw the silver into the sanctuary and departed. You see this similarity here again. Judith also was filled with remorse. So much so that he said, hey, I have betrayed innocent blood after he made Jesus guilty. After he betrayed him. And he took the silver coins and he went in there and he probably threw the sack and it spread all over the place. And you're the last coin dropped. And they said, well, the religious leaders were like, what's that to us? Go handle it on your own. Picture yourself being Judas at this moment. Knowing that there's no turning back now. Peter turned around. He was filled with remorse. And he went outside and he cried. I'm so sorry, God, for what I've done. Please forgive me. Judas went outside. And he was feeling bad. What have I done? I've betrayed innocent blood. What have I done? Oh my goodness. What am I going to do? And so we pick up the text here. In verse 5. And it says, So he threw the silver cords into the sanctuary, and then he departed. Then he went and he hung himself. Wow! A little bit over the top there. He had the opportunity just the same way that Jesus did. I mean, sorry, that Peter did. He had the opportunity to change his heart. Not just feel, be filled with remorse, but in a time when he was going through this identity crisis, Judas could have said, you know what? I'm going to go back. I'm going to just say sorry, Jesus. I'm going to say sorry to the rest of the guys. We know from the text that Peter returned to the Lord and the Lord returned back to Peter. He gave him what was uh, the authority for Peter to start preaching the gospel about Jesus, about repentance, and about baptism. And so he did. Judas, on the other hand, could have acquired the same type of message. He could have been preaching the same kind of gospel. We could have been reading about Judas today. Judas 1. First Judas. Second Judas. Maybe even third Judas. It would have been a powerful testimony. And he had, in the face of crisis, decided to maintain his spiritual composure, not given in to his emotional distress, and chose the Lord Jesus. Today, we're faced with many, many types of crisis. As Don mentioned earlier in Haiti. The world tells us that we have to act a certain way, dress a certain way, look a certain way, or we do not fit in. Our children on campuses, whether it be in grade school, middle school, high school, or even in the campuses, whether you're a single adult or married, we're facing daily emotional battles. How do I act? How do I, how do I present myself before people? Why do I even care about what people say about me? Today, you have to make a decision whether you're going to be saying, I'm so sorry, I betrayed the Lord, please forgive me, and be restored to the Lord. Or say, I'm so filled with remorse, why did I do that to God? And then walk away and hang your spiritual self. Many have come to know the truth about Jesus and made Jesus Lord of their life and walked away. Simply because they were in a time of identity crisis. When their true colors really rose to the top. And all they could do is think about, number one, self. Today, we're challenged and face to face with adversity. We're, we're, we're challenged with homosexuality on a, on a daily basis. We're challenged with hate. Our children go to school. You wouldn't believe the amount of homeschooling, the statistics in homeschooling, has skyrocketed up. Because parents are afraid to put their children into campuses where they were beaten and killed and tempted to do sex, drugs, slandered all over the internet with this technology. It is so true. Isn't it? And then we were, we're living constantly and Satan is going, I'm going to put fear into these people so that I can cause crisis in their life that they would not choose the Christ. And so in a time of crisis, do you choose the Christ or your crisis? Where do you stand today? I think about growing up and who whom I was going to be. I grew up without a mom and a dad, and so it was very hard for me to understand 
how do I, how do I act? How do I behave around other people? I was just a weird kid. I mean, I would do laundry for my, my friend's mother and mow their lawn and clean the house better because I was always looking for that approval from the parents. So much so that they would take me shopping and do stuff with me and be like, wow, I should train you back for one of these kids of mine. And I caused a lot of trouble that way too because I was seeking the, uh, the attention. But we're like that with the Father. We're like that with God today. We want attention from Him, but when crisis comes, when our friends tell us, you're so uncool, you Christian guy, giving all your money to the church. Get out. This is weird. Nine times. Didn't you get 20 last year? Goodness gracious. When are you going to quit? These guys are going to take all your money. You change your life so much, you don't even cuss. I can't believe you want to even go to a bar with me anymore. Hey, what's one more adultery? And your friends can pull you in. And then your face. Lord, I'm sorry. I sinned against you. Or, I'm so filled with remorse. I'm going to go hang myself up spiritually. I don't want to quit in the Lord. I challenge you today that if you're going through a spiritual crisis, to be inspired that today you can have the same heart of Peter and rethink and realign the way your spiritual, your spiritual path is right now. Maybe you're on the right path, but perhaps maybe you've been teeter teeter-tottering a little bit. Today is the day when you make a decision, a spiritual stance for righteousness and go, you know what? No longer will I live in shame because of Christianity. No longer will I stop reading my Bible every day and denying getting close to my father. No longer will I let the problems of other people and what they say about me and how they think about me affect who I am today. I will stand for righteousness, I will live by the scriptures, and I will remain a, uh, a child of God. Amen? Amen. Now, fast forward in Peter's life, you see that Peter arrested, he messed up the church in the early days of Jerusalem. He's, he's battled off during the most intimate times of the Lord. Oh, I'll make three deaths for you. And during a time where they were face to face with Jewish leaders, he cut the ear off of somebody. And Jesus was like, dude, what are you doing? Put the sword away. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry about that, guys. And so, moving <laughs> further, and this guy was only, I mean, he rebuked Jesus. You're not going anywhere, Jesus. You'll be right here, just like I said. Then he told Jesus, hey, you're out of your mind. I am never going to deny you. Peter was not the brightest. That's why when he professed that, that he was the son of the living God, Jesus was like, whoa, that can only come from God. Because you're an idiot, Peter. <laughs> and Peter was like, oh, I can't argue that. But let's take a look up here in First Peter. See the heart of Peter here. You guys with me? Yes. The heart of Peter is amazing. In 1 Peter 5, we pick up our text, starting in verse 1. And we look at the heart of Peter and how he changes dramatically. And how standing the test of time and during a time of crisis, it really matured him to move on to greater things and to behave in a way that was more composed in his life. But it did not come without self-realization and acting and changing and shifting and molding and starting anew. And not being afraid to step forward and taking a chance and diving most forward in order that he would mature to this point. And in chapter 5, starting verse 1, it says, Therefore, as, fellow, as a fellow elder and a witness to the sufferings of the Messiah, and also a participant in the glory about to be revealed, I exhort the elders among you, shepherds of God's flock among, among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but freely according to, to God's will. Not for the money, but, but eagerly. Not lording it over those who entrust it to you, but being examples to the flock. And then when the chief sheep, uh, shepherd appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. In the same way, the younger men subject yourself to the older men. And all of you clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting your care on him because he cares about you. Be serious and be alert. Your, your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. I just love this, this translation. It brings a whole new meaning to life. We look here, uh, we're, we're talking about 64 to 67 AD now. The maturity level of Peter has come to the point where he's, he's saying, hey guys, don't be proud of me and just start swinging your sword and saying whatever you want. Don't tell the Lord what to do, but let the Lord tell you what to do. How about yourself, where before I would tell the Lord, hey, 
do this, Jesus, and do that, Jesus. He's changed. He's shifted. He's molded into this new creation. He's unrecognizable to the point that maybe we should do some research and find out, this is the same Peter? This cannot be the same Peter. Are you unrecognizable because of you stand the test of time? The people in your workplace, do they look at you and go, wow, that person has not changed. They've really stood their ground. We've tempted them in every way, but they really stood their ground. I believe they're truly Christians. Are you humble when you're communicating in your marriage? Woo, that's a big one. How many, how, how many married people we have here? Oh my goodness. How many of you wives contest that your husbands are difficult? <laughs> difficult husband sometimes. I'm very demanding. I live in like the first century time where I'm like, come forth, women, and serve me. Kiss my ring. And I, like, she's so graceful that she'll just come over and she's all. And I'm like, all the way home, I'm like, oh, I deserve that. Peter changed. I beg you and I challenge you that during times when you're faced with, with challenges, that you will do the same. Amen? We move on and move forward to our second point. Our second point is, there's no sincerity in false identity. There's no sincerity in false identity. You know, I was a, uh, I owned a, bar, a bouncing uh, a group before, it was a business. And so I have big bouncer guys in every position in most clubs in Arizona. And so my job was to oversee them and make sure they were doing a good job. And what's funny is that you could count on every Saturday night, not so much in the set, on, on the Friday nights, but every Saturday night, all the women got taller, their hair got shinier, they smelled better, their nails were longer. For some reason, the guys were looking sharper, the teeth were whiter, they actually brushed their teeth that night, and they put on their own for the first time. And they would line up, and I was at this club where, uh, who was coming in? It was uh, Tyrese who was coming in, Tyrese. Tyrese. And so he was going to do his uh, singing. He just cut an album. And so this line went out all the way to the road. All the way up to the road. There must have been. It was sold out. So there was 2,600 people there. Wow. And so my bouncers were like just trying to get people in the door because the concert was ready to start. But I was looking around going, that, that person is not 18. That person is not 21. What are they doing tomorrow? So I started to get crazy. I'm like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? So I took my flashlight, it's a special flashlight that I have, and I start checking IDs as the women come in, they were all trying to make themselves beautiful, mm, I'm gonna have myself a good time, all this. And then as they approach, I, I just, the bouncer would be like, all right, you're good, move forward. I was like, whoa, hold up, wait a minute. Let me see your ID. I look at the ID and go, what year were you born? Yeah. What year was your mom born? What year were you born? You're out, get out of here. So what I would do is I would take the ID and I would just throw it on the ground to make them embarrassed. So they would go over there and go, I have to go against them. Like, I don't want to come to this club anyways. I want to go to a better club. And they would leave embarrassed because their identity was false. And I can tell you, whenever I busted one and I made it real loud, and I said, if anybody else has a fake ID, please leave the club now. Like 20 people would leave at a time. <laughs> and it was, mainly, it was mainly the women. And so, so I felt so bad because they would walk away and I all perfume stuff that's a cloud of perfume would leave. And it felt so bad and it was so awkward, you know? But with the Lord, one day the scripture says we would all have to give an account yeah. to the Master. Yeah. And we want to prepare ourselves to push through our worldly crisis because it's going to be a time where God is going to be at the front door and He's going to have the light. He's going to be like, Mark, what year were you born spiritually? How long were you a disciple? How long were you a Christian? Dude, get out of here. It's a fake ID. And he'll throw it around. I'm, like, I'm going to be the guy who goes, oh, man. Oh, church guys are looking at me. This is embarrassing. And this can happen to anybody. But I want to ask you something. Do you have a well forged identification card today? Or are you carrying a passport that really can't be stamped in heaven? It's hard to tell. Guys from all over the world, people are making fake. Identification, you don't know if it's imitation or bona fide. Uh, we went tagging, as uh, Janelle was mentioning, that we can raise money in Phoenix over like a, a month time 
I got like $600 of fake $100 bills. You couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell the difference. And I, every time I go to the bank and I cash it in, they're like, come here. And I'm like, what? They're like, these are fake. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm just trying to get money for the Lord. And I couldn't tell the difference. You know who can tell the difference? The Lord. When you walk in there, you can tell whether you're, you're bona fide or counterfeit. And I don't want to be exposed, you know, when they put you under the light and then put the marker on you. And they go, oh, the markers stay the same color. Oh, that's not going to hurt so good around the family. But we look at we look at this, and we're going to take a look at the example that we have here. There is no sincerity in false identity. Turn to Acts 19 for a second example. Isn't that funny? If we got to heaven and there really was a marker that rubbed in our skin. <laughs> and so this is one of the most amazing and vivid pictures that you can ever imagine in the scriptures from me as far as I'm concerned in the New Testament. Of all the scriptures, this one always gets me twisted. I fall down laughing, I cry, I'm scared, I'm, I'm alone, I feel sheltered, I feel not sheltered. I don't want to think about this story here. But... We can disguise ourselves as much as we want and say, I'm a Christian. I'm a disciple. I'm a believer. I'm an involved family of God. But you look, we're going to look at this example here that's pretty, pretty darn radical. And so we're going to, we're going to start off in verse uh, 11 of chapter 19. And it says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. So that even the, the, the face cloths or the aprons that he had touched that touched the skin, were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them. Can you imagine that? He's so real. He's such a disciple. He's so filled with the Spirit that even an apron or a piece of clothing, a piece of fabric, can touch him. And somebody could take that fabric and just go up and go, Bianca, she was healed. No more sadness. Carrie touched her. No more disease. That's exactly what happened. So much so that you can just take a fabric. You don't even need to take the person. Like, dude, can you take up the coat and rope? I'm going to put on my daughter real quick. Boom. She can walk again. This was what was happening. Because of the faith and the uh, 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 authenticity of the disciple. They were real, qualified. And so we continue in verse 13. It says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempt to pronounce, uh, pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you in the name that, of Jesus that Paul preaches, seven sons of Sceva were doing this. Now, what we're talking about here is we're not talking about a bunch of uneducated kids. We're talking about kingdom kids. We're talking about children who grew up in the church. We're talking about people who understand the law. And they were going out performing exorcisms, trying to rebuke demons in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. Did you catch that? It was that Paul preached in the name of Jesus. So they're like, hey, let's do that too. They came along, hey, let's monkey see monkey. Do. We can expel demons too. So they were doing it for their own benefit. And continuing on here in verse, um, let's just pick it up in verse 15. Then some itinerant uh, Jewish exorcists attempted to, to pronounce in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the, by the Jesus that Paul preaches, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Again, what an awkward situation. You're over here, and you're like, come on, demon, you better get out of that girl. Get out, demon, get out of that man. And then all of a sudden, the demon turns around. <laughs> Hold on. I know Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but you, I don't know you. 
Then the man who had the evil spirit leaped on them. Oh my goodness. Overpowered them all, all seven of them, and prevailed against them so much that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. Most of the versions say naked and bleeding. They were covered with blood. Can you imagine these seven guys? Well, guys, follow me. And you are, you're the oldest brother and you're walking around. You got your cool walk. And then you walk up to this demon and you're like, come on! And then he goes, what? <laughs> all seven of you right now, all seven of you, jumps on you, got you in the arm bar, twists your legs off, and he's beating all of you down to the point where you're walking out naked. You know how much it takes to pull off a cloak off a person? Yeah. It says they took off his sandals. I don't know about you, but naked is like when a newborn baby comes out. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's got a little belt of corn coming out. That's naked to me. And all seven of them, the sting overpowered them. One person jumped on them, set up at a time. Maybe you had two, and it was just like, Whoosh! and they're like, came off like basketball here. I don't know what he did. But seven of them were stripped, naked. They went outside and they were bleeding because they were not true apostles. They were not true followers. They were not truly devoted to the word of God. And so we can walk on in our life, taking our steps. And one day, we're going to find out, when we're faced with adversity, how you act, whether you're truly filled with the Spirit. Is this my watch? Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, that's city water. With lemon. And we're going to continue our text here. We'll find out what happens. And we're going to start off in verse 17. It says, This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Then they feared them and fell on them. Uh, fell on them. And then in the, in the name of the Lord, Jesus was, it was magnified. The word, of the word of God was magnified. Jesus himself was magnified because these guys were so scared. In 18, I mean, verse 18, it says, And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. While many of those who had practiced magic arts collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated the value and found it to be about 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. These guys, the whole neighborhood. I mean, how do you stop this rumor from going? How do you stop this story? You've got to be out of your mind. Getting beaten up like that, you got a whooping, everybody's gonna know. I mean, you know that if somebody got a whooping in your school, you would know about it. Yeah. You know? You would know if a husband and wife was fighting in the church, you would know about it. You would know when one of your kids are not doing well in your house, you would know about it. One of your family members, you would know about it. Yeah. But these guys came and got their butt whooped. And then they went out so much so that the people realized it. They came to come clean with the Lord. They brought their scrolls and their magic arts and all their things, their sin, basically. And they said, you know what? We're going to confess. This is who I really am. And I'm so sorry, Lord. And I want to change. And it was so much so that in the way of the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. Is the Lord's messaging prevailing in your life today? Does it have so much value of your, you know, your personal life? Are you cashing in and taking everything that you have and giving up all your sin? They said that these guys took so much of their past life and their sin that it added up to 50,000 pieces of silver. Wow. Now, I didn't get prepared to come up with a translation of that, but I'm sure some of, some of them, maybe Bryson will come up with it later on, But because he's that kind of guy. But it says 50,000 pieces of silver, the value of all their false doctrine. There must have been a big pile of magic art books. If there's something in your life right now that you can turn in and go, you know what? I, I'm just such an angry man. When I'm no one's looking, I get mad at my wife. When no one's looking, I get I get so upset at my children. When no one's looking and, and my business is not doing well, and I'm not feeling spiritual. I just I throw in the towel. I want you to, to consider this. Bring all that junk and put it right in the front and, and burn it up. Because it's getting in the way of you having a true identity with the Lord. We do not need to be acting that way, the Bible says. I look at this, and it's so dramatic what the Lord puts here in the, in the scriptures. But he made it so dramatic because we're, in face, we're facing 
such a dramatic crisis right now. No one wants to say the word hell, because it's like a, a curse word, but hell is true. And if hell is true, then heaven is true. Uh, the average human being will survive at least 75 years. If hell is true and heaven is true, that means we're going to be either dead for an eternity or alive for an eternity. You get to choose. That's the awesome thing about the scriptures. You don't. You get to make the decision. God loves us so much that He gave us free will to decide our fate. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You know, I, I uh, must have been 15 years old, and there's this beautiful uh, Latina girl. She's the only Latina in my island, and her name was uh, Regina. I probably never told you about this wife, so don't freak out. So <laughs> this girl, Regina was so beautiful, and I've never seen a Spanish woman before. And so I was like, I gotta date her. So I, I would borrow my brother's clothes, I would use my brother's cologne, and I borrowed my uncle's car. And, I, and he's like, are you sure you're gonna take care of my car? And I was a Lincoln Versailles, and it was brand new. Uh, or brand new to him, he shipped it from the States. And so I went on the date, and I spent all my money, and I was really accounting, do I have enough to take her out? And, get her ice cream, I don't know. And so, as the night guy, I was like, I'm gonna kiss this girl, by the end of the night, I'm gonna kiss her. And so, I, I, didn't, I didn't even have a driver's license at the time. And so, all of a sudden, we're driving, and I started seeing the front of the windows fogging up. And I was like, oh no. That could only mean one thing. The radiator hose probably busted. And before you know it, the temperature was, Whoa! the car went, and there it was. Two o'clock in the morning on my way back to my master plan to kiss this girl and the car died up. I don't have a cell phone and she has a cell phone the size of a shoebox. <laughs> it was very cheap. It was $9.92 per minute back in, those, back in those days. So she took it and there was a cord and I said, can you dial this number? She was right there in the car with me and I was like, Uncle, sorry I broke your car. And she was like, this is not your car? I was so embarrassed. I tried to fake like I was somebody that I was not. I thought I had game. What happens is our Christianity is exactly like that. We try to act like we have Christian game. But the truth is, when you go home at night, tonight, you're going to know exactly who you are because you're going to have the same lonely thoughts. You're going to have the same impure thoughts. You're going to have the same empty feeling. You're going to have the same false happiness from the things that you have that are physical that will disappear one day. I want to challenge you and inspire you that today, if there's, if there's something in your life right now that is false, to bring it to God and have Him change your ways. Come on. So you can have an incredible, incredible, just an incredible and a phenomenal relationship with them that matters to no one else but between you and God. And that is what I want to inspire to you. Okay. So there is no serenity in false again. The third point that I want to bring to us is the only way to the Father is through baptism of the water. The only way to the, fa to the Father is through baptism of the water. You know, I was born in Guam, uh, Guam, USA, and it's a small island with only about, when I was there, it was only 70,000 people. It's about shy of 200,000 now. And I, my, my grandfather gave the property to, uh, to the, uh, I guess, the Pope and asked for some property. And so my grandfather would jump on it and say, hey, let's give the property, it's a beachfront property. And so they cleared this place up and built a huge, enormous church that could fit so, so many people in it. And it was royal. I spent all my, my mom, and when my mom passed on, I didn't have a father. I would spend many nights in there. Every now and then I'd go up and I'd try to creep up to the Bible to try to see what it was. But I would always get slapped and put outside and get beaten by the nuns or whoever it was that was there. And I was confused. I was like, how do I know? How do I, even as a child, I was like, how do I know if I'm going to go to heaven? And I always wondered that. And I was like, no one's ever showed me. All I know is that I was baptized as a child and I have this little document that proves it. So I decided I'm going to go on a journey. I took this baptismal certificate and I went straight to the guy, the priest, because he was still alive. I said, did you baptize me? He goes, oh, I baptized so many kids. I don't know who they are. And so, but am I going to be saved? He goes, you know what? God is so, so gracious. He knows, he knows our heart. But he didn't answer my question. So in 2006, I was met and I started studying the Bible. And I was like, I really want a true relationship with God. But I don't know how to do this. So I, I got down on my knees and I prayed, God, please help me. 
I don't know if this is a prayer, but here it goes. If you show me the way, I will never back down. I do everything in my, every cell in my body to dedicate it to you. And I never turn back since. Never turn back. I have doubts in my life when I had time to press it, but I never turn back. And so I started the Bible and I realized that I didn't know anything I was talking about. And I didn't know hardly know anything at all. The guys that were studying me, studying the Bible with me, were out of shape. They were old. They were uncool. There was nothing for me to look at them and go, Oh, I want to become just like this guy. I own my own business. I was making so much money. I was a single parent. I had my own children. I had everything going for me. I, I, I was just like $7,000 ready to be out of debt. Ready to get married. My life was great. I just bought a $10,000 air conditioner and put it on top of my house. I had a beautiful Irish girl that I was going to marry. My life was just like this. And then God answered my prayer. A woman walked into my, to my office and asked me if I knew God. So I did the right thing. I lied to her. I said, of course I do. She said, and then I was like, oh no, I, I don't know God. I prayed the other day. That was uh, Brandon Speckman. That's a lot of sisters. And so, she challenged me to come out to church. She came out and I studied the Bible. I, I did not like the church at all. I didn't know any of the songs. I never heard of this. We didn't even do one Ave Maria. We didn't do any Hail Mary. I was so used to that. We didn't do any of the things that I was used to. So I felt a little bit awkward. We went to Chipotle and the next, I, we started doing a Bible study. I was like, oh yeah, let's, let's figure this out. It wasn't until the second study I realized that the spotlight was on me. And I was the frog on the table getting split open. You know? Then, then after, after the second time, I said, like, hey guys, I, I, I'm not that dumb. I only look that way, but are you studying the Bible with me? You're trying to educate me? They're like, well, yeah. Well, we're already saved. And I said, prove it. So they start showing me these scriptures. But one of the scriptures that really helped me to understand, I said, I don't want to hear all your mumbo jumbo church. Don't give me a multi level marketing thing. Cut to the chase, dude. I'm a very direct guy. So they said, okay. Well, what do you want out of Christianity? I said, I want to know how to get to the Father. Show me the visible road. Where's this elevator? Is there a special cloud? Is there a portal? Someone show me. Because I have no idea. I grew up a Roman Catholic, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, uh, Christian, pagan believer, breakdancing, punk rocker. And I have no idea. Can you show me the way? They're like, yes. But first you need to shut your mouth. So I shut my mouth. And they read the scripture to me in 1 Peter 3. I hope you're enjoying the lesson today. And I hope you're being inspired to face who you are before the Lord, not before me or before each other. Because in the end, we just want to be loving and a great family who believes in the convictions that the Bible says and not our own ideas. And then, so we're going to pick up our text in verse 13 of 1 Peter 3. And it says... Chapter 3 of uh, 1 Peter. And it's verse 13. It says, And who will harm you if you are deeply committed to do what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed, but honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason and the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Keeping your, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. After being put to death in a fleshly realm, but made alive in the spiritual realm. In, in that state, he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while an ark was being prepared. In it, a few, that is only eight, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not the removing of filth and flesh, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Christ. Now that he has gone into heaven, he is at God's right hand with the angels and the authorities and the powers subjected to him. And I said, that's how I need to get into heaven. There's the road map. How come no one has ever told me that? And I started to cry. I said, how is it that there's so many old people, 10 million churches around the world, and I don't know this? we got to tell people about this. They're like, hey, hey, hold your horses. Let's get you right first. 
first you're not just, you need to stop sleeping around. You said you're going to be married, but you're sleeping around. You need to stop cussing, because we're not going to go about studying with your cuss pound. That's okay. I'm going to stop. I'm going to change. I ain't going to give up this job, being this bouncer company thing. There's all kinds of naked girls in there. You need to quit that, too. I was like, that, too? You mean, like, not be in the concert? I was challenged. And the crisis came. Then I was like, oh, a little roadblock there. Even though I knew the path to get to heaven. He was like, ugh, roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And I had to come to an understanding. I even lied as a man trying to seek after God. I, I purposely brought all the disciples to come to the club that I worked at. And I made them come to gigs like Whose Line Is It Anyways in and to uh, clean concerts. But then one day, my friend Matt Sullivan, who studied the Bible with me, decided that he was going to take his wife on an encouraging date to uh, see uh, some country. And I said, anytime you want to take it, psst, just it's on me. So he looked down there and he goes, Luke, the guy who baptized me, I need you to talk to Mark about something. Because uh, there's some X-rated looking things in that thing. And so Luke came to me and he said, bro, you need to pick. And I picked that day and my boss says, you need to go to work. Or you can take your <laughs> and get out of here. So I said, you know what? The beep it is. And so I left. And I never turned back. So I knew that this is the roadmap to be with God in heaven. Why in the world will I not take it? When someone says, there is three. There it is. You're looking for McDonald's? It's right there. See those golden arches? Right there. Just go there. Just go down the street. But there's a sidewalk and a crosswalk. Well, just cross it. Walk all across it. Would you not go there? If someone said, if you're hungry, your stomach was like, Arr. where's Denny's? It's right there. It's a big D. Right there. Denny's. Just walk up there and go get it. You would go over there and do it. If someone told you right now, I have $20,000 for you. And it's in one of these rooms. Even if I didn't tell you how to get to it. You would be leaving right now and not be preaching to nobody because you're going to look for it because your credit cards are maxed. And you're wondering, how do I get out of that? But it's the value of God's kingdom and being in the kingdom of eternal heaven valuable enough for you to stop the obstacles in your life and follow the roadmap, stay committed to the path to get to heaven. Oh, is it? Oh, uh, think about this and you can turn over to Genesis 6 real quick. It says in the days of Noah, only eight in all were saved. And I think about this because it's a patient ride. Some people get baptized as teens and they go, Luke, you mean to tell me I don't get to sleep around behind, uh, with a girl? And I'm like, yeah, Nate, Nate Reed did it for 20 years. Oh, How about oh, you? Right. What's your excuse? What's your excuse? But I need all my money. I give up all my money. What's your excuse? There's no excuse. And we look here at three different areas. In Genesis 6, starting in verse 14, it says, Make yourself an ark out of gopher wood and make the rooms in the ark and cover it with pitch inside and outside. This is how you are to make it. The ark would be 400 feet long, 70 feet, 75 feet wide, and 40, uh, 45 feet high. You are to make a roof finishing the sides of the ark within 18 inches. And, it's, and it goes on to talk about the blueprints of this construction. This man was to look at the most idiotic man on the planet at this time, convincing his family that there will be a flood for 40 days. But trusting the Lord, he did it. He went out and bought the fields, rode in the trees. I don't even know how he could have got all that wood there, be honest with you, with eight guys. There must have been some big Samoan sons of his. And, but they got the wood there somehow. Maybe they cut down the wood and another tree sprung up. Who knows? But it says here, in, uh, go back to uh, uh, chapter 5 and verse 32. It says here that Noah was 500 years old and fathered Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. He was 500 years old. Now turn over to chapter 7. Turn over to chapter 7 real quick. In verse 11 it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month of the 7th, and it talk, breaks down this calendar date. We're talking about 100 years, 100 possible years. I don't know what the calendar dates were back then, but according to this in English, it was 100 years later. God never showed up and never appeared to, to Noah's life. Well, hey, let me encourage you, bro. Looks like you got a splinter in your hand. Let me heal that. Shh. No. He never made a second appearance going, Noah, you need to stay faithful to me. All the animals will come. 
never was. And imagine the neighbors coming around going, hey, no, well, how's the uh, building, buddy? How's the ball business going, huh? Hey, look, there's jet ski customers all around. Nothing. They ridiculed him. They made him feel small, day after day. You're walking by people, and you're, you're over here, you've got your axe. People are going, yeah, it's going to be they're, in, they're embarrassed for this man. And for a hundred years, he put up with this. And then the wife is, no, are you sure? Uh, actually, Tim Kernan did this, uh, this sermon in the staff meeting. And he says, are you sure he said to build an ark? He didn't tell you to like build a park? <laughs> are you sure he didn't say to like have a child and name him Mark? <laughs> You sure he didn't say, like, take an art? No. He said to build an art. And this is the way you're to do it. You sure he didn't say that the sign would be like a dog would bark? No. He said to build an art. So we built an art. And in Tim's message, he said that he, there must have been tons of announcements. There might have been an announcement in every radio station back then. He said, red alert, red alert. The world will now sink. Forty days and forty nights there'll be floods. It'll be partly cloudy and a lot of rain. So fill up your tubs. You're all gonna die. And eight people, all in all, were saved for one hundred years. As a disciple of Christ, it takes a conviction of Noah to go. You know what? I am gonna believe that even in a hundred years, if I never get in my way, if I never get the girl that I really want, if the boy of my dreams never comes into my life. If I never get the job that I really want, and if Lord never blesses me according to the way I feel, I am going to build that ark to get to heaven. Yeah. I'm going to follow the path that Jesus says to go through to get to the Father. Yeah. The only way to the Father is through baptism of the water. Acts 2, and we're going to come in for that. Acts, written by Paul, I'm uh, sorry, by Luke, the physician, writes this. At a very crucial time in the beginning of the church in the first century. And he addresses the crowds then, last year, this very day, as the words, the words of the Lord will be read. And I challenge you as we look into the scripture that if your life has not matched up with anything that we read yet, don't let your true colors of humanity rise. Let your decision be based on the doctrine, the Holy Word of God. Don't walk out of here just another statistic going, but that's not the way my grandmother taught me, but that's not the way uncle such and such, my pastor who I love so much, he never did me wrong, said, if the scriptures say it, I am begging you, I'll stop at the door on my knees and I will have to kick my teeth in, but please don't leave until you really research your heart and find out, does my life match up with the doctrine? It's very important. In Acts 2, starting at verse 36, it reads, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know this with certainty, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they, were, they came under deep conviction and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Repent, Peter said, to them and be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He said this to grown-ups. He said this to grown-ups for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And it's not our decision whether somebody makes the decision or not. The Bible says that it's up to God. It's as many as the Lord our God will call. Our duty as disciples is to just do the job and get the word out. Verse 40, it says, And with many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And what does that look like? The kingdom of God. The very yeah. church of the living Christ. Yeah. They devoted every day. If you were not devoting your life every day, you might want to question yourself. Like, 
hmm, well, maybe I got some thinking to do. And this is what he said. The only way to the Father is through baptism in order to be forgiven. It doesn't, there's no other place in the Bible that will ever, I don't care how many experts you bring right now, you're not going to see another way to be saved except to be forgiven through baptism. As an adult, you make a conscious decision to repent, to turn away from our sins. Yes. You can't do that as a child. The only sinful nature you have is a burp and maybe a, a occasional diarrhea. That is not sin. That's probably a heavenly sound to the saints. I'm not being serious. This is the kind of faith we need. This is the kind of pledge we need to need. This is the kind of conscience we need to pledge to God. You know, I, I have this favorite song. I don't know where that is. <laughs> I was spared you. But this is a... What is this? Oh, what is it? Nicole Collins. And this song is called Redeemer. We talked about identity crisis. We talked about the true colors rising in the face of identity crisis. We talked about there is no sincerity in false identity. We talked about the only way to the Father is through baptism with the water. And we look at this lyrics here and I, think, I say to myself, this is identity of someone who understands who they are in their own skin. And the lyrics go, who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? Who taught the ocean you can only come this far? Who showed the moon where to hide to evening? Whose words alone can, can catch a falling star? Well, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. All of creation can testify. This life is within my cry. I know that my Redeemer lives. This very same God that spins the things into orbit, and spins things in orbit, He runs to the weary, the worn, and the weak. And at the same gentle hands that holds me when I'm broken. They conquered death to bring me victory. Now I know that my Redeemer lives, and I know that my Redeemer lives. Let all creations testify, this life is within my cry. And I know that my Redeemer lives. He lives to take away my shame. And He lives forever, I'll proclaim that payment for my sin with the precious life He gave. But it is alive, and there is an empty grave. Now I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. And who taught the sun? Where to hide in the morning? And who taught the ocean where to come this far? But who showed the moon where to hide to evening? Only the Lord. We're constantly navel gazing. And we're wondering how we're going to be saved when the roadmap is there. Do not leave today, I beg you. I'll stand in the door and you can kick in my teeth and you can kill me, but I will die until the gospel is heard. <coughs> Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.